All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, so first question before we even start, who's the committee here in the room? Who's an Eclipse committer? OK, two, three, wow. four, five. You should know how your day looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so you can, you can help us out, or you can correct <laughs> if we say anything that isn't right. Are there any Eclipse contributors in the room? OK, excellent. Well, that's good. We'll have 20 more contributors by the end of the talk. <laughs> And please feel free to interrupt us anytime and ask questions. So maybe just a word to my person. Uh, I'm Benjamin Muscala. And when we go a few months back, what I, I was one of, like most people here, I was just an Eclipse user. I was using Eclipse as my IDE. I was happily refactoring all the time and using JDT and all that stuff. I was installing plugins, but I was only using that IDE. And a couple of months back, I actually met Stefan here. And he's a pretty cool guy. And you can tell Benjamin is full of shit, because he's been a committer for I don't know how many years. I've, I've been a committer for six years, I think. And we actually met at EclipseCon here in Ludwigsburg, yeah, I think. Yeah, that's right. Um, but we'll pretend that Benjamin just Today, I'm, I'm a regular Eclipse user. <laughs> just, for, just for now. And if we look at um, the, the Eclipse user base as a pyramid, um, we'll notice that on the bottom of the pyramid, we have lots of users. We have millions of Eclipse users. I know, Wayne, do you know what the numbers are? Six, six million. Um, so that's, that's hell of a lot. And some of these users are configurers. I, for Benjamin example, invented, I, I'm, it's the first time I see this term, so it's... No, actually, I didn't invent that term. Um, if you look back in the, in the book from Eric Gamma and Ken Beck about contributing to Eclipse, they actually came up with that idea of a pyramid, like that you have this huge, really huge user base. You have configurers, for example, people like me, changing settings in your ID. Okay, that's not fancy yet, but let's, let's go a step further. Like, you start using Eclipse, you start configuring it to your needs, after that, you extend it, like you start extending it. For example, installing new plugins. We just saw in the last talk, like people install stuff like ECLMR and uh, web tools or whatever. So they actually, they extend their IDE to the needs they have. After that, they, they grow, like the user base or the, the base of people who are doing that gets, gets smaller and smaller. People start publishing plugins. There, who's, who in this room has ever published an, an Eclipse plugin? One, two, three, oh, almost half of you. That's great. We have the right people here. So over that, like if, over time, you get more and more involved with the whole ecosystem. Um, maybe you even work for a company using Eclipse not only as a tool, but also as a, as a platform. And this is where people start using, really integrating Eclipse into their own products. Like for example, we do at Tastop. But if you, if you reach that level, there's still like the tip of the iceberg, and that's where, what we are talking about today, and that's the committers. It's the poor souls writing the code that actually makes Eclipse run. <laughs> the poor and souls. The meritocracy is the principle um, that, that is used throughout the Eclipse community to move up in this pyramid and to become a committer. So, but first of all, what is Eclipse? Benjamin, what is Eclipse to you? What is Eclipse to me? So, Eclipse to me is, like, being here at EclipseCon, it's way more than just the software. It's like this whole ecosystem around it. And I think Wayne is the right, the right guy to talk to when it comes <laughs> to ecosystems. Um, so, for, for me, Eclipse, when we look back at the history of Eclipse, it was invented or invented by IBM. It was created by IBM. It was open sourced um, due to the whole idea of well, like to be vendor neutral. The whole foundation was founded, and so the foundation has the Eclipse Foundation doesn't actually do any coding. So besides Wayne, who actually sometimes contributes to projects, the foundation is is there to help the committers get their stuff done. So it starts with the whole IP thing. I think we will talk a little bit about it later. It's the whole infrastructure we need as committers to get, our, to get the programs built, run, tested, downloadable. That's all the foundation helps us to provide the servers, 
like our version control system, our task management system, all the all these things, these are coming from, from the foundation. And also the foundation helps us with development processes. And is there anything you think that we should mention for Eclipse? Yeah, I mean, maybe we, we, we could mention that like 10 years ago when, when IBM created it, it was really that IDE that you can still download. But now it's 11 top level projects covering all kinds of different aspects. So over time, this, this IDE has grown into this platform that provides all kinds of different services. Um, and all these projects on Eclipse Sword that create these, the, the source that create these um, artifacts are governed by the Eclipse development process. And the Eclipse development process really has three key principles. First one is transparency. So anything, all the development that happens on Eclipse work is transparent. So you can, you can of course look at the source code, you can look at all the discussions in Bugzilla, you can look at the documentation in the wiki, you can, you can get the project plans. Conference calls are usually public, so anyone, anyone can join and listen in what the project is up to. So it's all very transparent. I think that's, that's also one of the, of the big challenge and, challenges and also goals for the Eclipse projects to be open. Like for many, many people are working together in their offices on Eclipse projects, but even if you were discussing stuff like over a coffee, it should still end up on the discussion forums, on the mailing list, on the tasks related to that. So from the outside, everybody sees why these decisions were made, um, how we came to that decision, so transparency is, in my eyes, a pretty, pretty important thing for Eclipse projects. Absolutely, and also openness on top of transparency. So it's good that everybody knows what you're up to, but the Eclipse development process goes one step further and really um, requires projects to, to be open to participation so that there's a level playing ground so that everybody can actually join into the discussion, can, can voice their opinion, and can influence projects from the outside. And last but not least, what I find the hardest of the, these principles is diversity. So each project needs to actively seek out and bring in new organizations, new individuals to support the project. That's really part of the whole process so that you, you create diversity. If one party goes away, the project will still survive. And I think we, there, there are a couple of good and bad examples in the Eclipse ecosystem. I think um, mentioning one of the bad examples is when a project only has one single contributor, like one single team or one single company is responsible for the whole project. So there is actually no diversity. When they don't, like if they don't have the idea or they don't have the time to, to contribute to it anymore, it will die naturally. So that's why diversity is so important. And I think um, EGIT, for example, is a great, is a great example of how different companies can collaborate on one single project. Like we see here a couple of companies contributing to the code base, contribu contributing to that project, which is so important so it stays alive even if one company decides, hey, we don't have any time for it anymore. And for every Eclipse project, you can go to the About page and it has this chart that shows you the activity in the SCM for the last 90, um, 90 days. And the Mylon Builds project, for example, is really bad because <laughs> Tassov is the only company contributing to it, whether you get has four, five, six parties. There was a hint. <laughs> working on it. Um, so we've said project a couple times. Um, so, you know, why, why can't I just go and create a new project on Eclipse? You can. It's pretty easy, actually, after 30, 40 steps. Um, so actually, at Eclipse, creating a project might not be as easy as on GitHub, but it provides you a lot of other things that are important enough to consider. So creating a new project or being a project at Eclipse means you get all these services from the foundation, starting from web space to a build server to uh, the, the review server to servers for uh, hosting your, your whole source code, and also gives you some governance. And we will talk about that later, I think, a little bit. But, what, I mean, before you get all of this, what do I have to do? So I've, 
So when like, you start a new project, so we have an idea. We want to start a new project. Well, what do we have to do? We have to we have to write a proposal that describes right. the scope of our project in detail. It says what are we going to do? What are we not going to do? We have to find interested parties who actually want to consume this project. We have to come up with a list of committers who are going to work on the project, and we actually have to have an initial code contribution. So before we can even get started, we already have to have something okay. um, where we can start off from. So that sort of, the, the idea is, and, and then we have to post a proposal and then everybody can give feedback and if somebody objects, then we have to deal with that. Um, and only after that proposal has been approved, we get all of the, its provision and we get all of these services and we can actually start working. Um, but the, I mean, the idea is that that not everybody like on GitHub starts a project and then commits some code and then two weeks later forgets about it. And uh, we, we end up with all these dormant projects, but it's actually, it requires some effort. The idea is to provide a sustainable project. Right. Question, um, where will you file such a request? You send it's it. It's not in Mozilla, right? I don't know, maybe these days you can, <laughs> I mean. <laughs> The, what I would do is I would send an email to EMO at Eclipse.org, which is Eclipse Management Organization, and that ends up in Wayne's inbox. And then um, next, Wayne is the, <laughs> the person in the back. Um, and then from then on, Wayne will probably ask you to, there's a template that you have to use for the project proposal, and then you have to write it, and then Wayne will complain that it's not right, and then you I have think to revise it. A good point to start is also always eclipse.org slash legal. There you find all the processes and how you should do different things. And creating a new project is also like it's a bullet list of things you have to do. And yeah, I would say always ping Wayne. <laughs> so now we have projects, Stefan. Um, let's, let's for now maybe not create a whole new project today. Um, let's start it a little bit smaller. So when we look at the, at the top level projects, uh, we have a, a couple of them. Like we have modeling projects, we have the Mylan top level project, we have platform and web tools, and they're also structured in, in another way. Like all of these top level projects also have sub projects. And like for example, these top level projects, they represent like the whole theme of, of things. For example, the web tools top level project it contains all these things about doing or coding for the web, but they don't actually have plugins or features themselves. They're split into different components again, and that's what's usually called um, sub-projects at Eclipse. And when we look at the top level project and go a little bit further, we have different projects with different committers on it. That's, that's a pretty important point because not all components are, for, for example, relevant as for you as a committer. You, may, you might only be interested in one component, but a completely different set of, of people is interested in another set of, co uh, or another component, but you still live under the same umbrella in that, in that top level project. So, yeah, let's look at a concrete example. Let's take Mylan. Um, like many projects, Mylan started under the technology top level project as a sub project under that and moved to tools as it matured. Um, and then finally became a top level project and we split it into different sub projects covering different aspects of the application lifecycle, which is sort of the overarching theme of the Mylon project. And under these sub projects are even sub sub projects that cover specific aspects like the VEX editor, which provides a visual editor for editing XML, which is part of Mylon docs. Um, but really this is just for managing different communities, different sets of committers. So Stefan, tell me, um, when I look at this project, at, like from the outside, how do I know, like, do I know what you're talking, or like what you're working on all day long, or is that something Excellent everybody... question. <laughs> I have a slide coming up. Oh, really? <laughs> well, That's impressive. That, that covers that question. There's actually, every project is required to um, publish a plan, and the plan describes what the project is up to and what it's planning to do for the next release. And you can, who, who has ever looked at an Eclipse projects plan? Wow, five, six, seven people. 
So I think it's really important to publish these plans because I, I often look at them to understand what a project is doing. I find them very useful and they're also linked from the about page. Right. But let's say, I mean, you know, you could do something that's not on the plan, obviously. Maybe somebody Let, let's do that like today. you comes along and wants to contribute a feature. I want to contribute something today. And so. usually that starts with Bugzilla. So um, this chart shows you the activity of the, the Bugzilla bugs created over the years in Eclipse. And it's between 30 and 40,000 new bugs every year, which I mean, that, that could mean that Eclipse is super buggy. <laughs> but I think it, it also shows that it's like Bugzilla is really the, the communication hub where all the requirements, all the collaboration around features, defects is really tracked. And um, if you actually want to contribute, this used to be pretty painful. Really? So when we look at how people contributed to Eclipse in the past, um, it's, it's actually a pretty interesting story. So what usually happened as a, as a contributor, so let, let's, let's take here, um, for, for today, that's me. I'm the contributor today. I want to contribute a new feature, like, or fix a bug, whatever. What I usually do is I create a task in the Bugzilla at Eclipse. I attach a patch and wait for somebody to review that. So that's how it used to be. What happened in the past was pretty simple. That patch was posted on Bugzilla. Somebody fetched the patch, tried it, like it, applied it to its workspace, tried it out, says, hey, it doesn't compile. So it goes back to the contributor saying, oh, sorry, uh, that was me. I will fix that. So you have a second patch on that, on that bug. The committer comes again, says, hey, that compiles, but the tests don't run. So this, this gets back and forth and back and forth all the time. That was pretty, pretty time consuming. That was pretty, pretty hard. And when you, when you finally approve that patch, the committer Fetch the patch, commits it to the social repository, be it CVS, SVN, or Git. And if you're lucky, you're done. If you're not lucky, at night, maybe your integration test fails, so you have to track down the, the contributor again to say, hey, can you please fix also the, all the integration tests? So that whole process is, is so painful, both for the, for the committer, but also for the contributor, because that isn't, that isn't fun to, to contribute to an open source project. So um, maybe, Stefan, can you explain it how it works today? <laughs> yes, yeah, so we're all lucky because the, the modern times have arrived at Eclipse Org. <laughs> um, these days, we have a code review server um, at Eclipse Org. Um, Eclipse is using Garrett, which is tightly integrated with Git. And that is accessible to anyone who has an account on Eclipse Org, which you can just create on, on an account creation page. Anyone can do that, and then anyone can push changes to the Garrett, to the code review server. And there's actually Hudson hooked up to the Garrett server, and that Hudson can verify the change, can automatically build it, can run all the tests, and then provide feedback on the change. Before anyone else has looked at the change, any, anyone can push it, and Hudson verifies it, and then if that all works out, um, committers, or anyone for that matter, can, can look at the change, can vote on it, when it's approved, it's automatically merged into the source control. And um, this looks really easy, and I think it is actually really easy. <laughs> Let's and try we're it out. just gonna put Benjamin in the hot seat and um, <laughs> just gonna try this out um, to show you how easy you can, you can contribute to an Eclipse project. So I just have yeah, to- so help, the... help me with that Mac thingy here. Um, Thank you. That feels like right. home. Okay, so this is the Eclipse RCP wrap package, which you can get uh, if you go to Eclipse org slash downloads. You can you can download exactly this um, Eclipse. That's and Eclipse for two, right? Yes, that's of nice. Of course, it's the latest, almost latest version. <laughs> um, so first, let's connect to the Garrett code review server. All right, so connecting to Garrett is pretty easy. We can add a task repository here and, in the task repository's view. We're cheating a little bit. Um, so, since we didn't know how flaky the network was going to be, we <laughs> replicated that exact infrastructure in the local VM. So instead of using Git Eclipse Org, we're going to use localhost. Um, so, so just trust us. <laughs> it works it's exactly the same. The same way. 
All right. So usually, when, when connecting to the to the Gary Data Eclipse, I would use my Paxilla user ID and password here. Um, I think for this local one, it's pass, it's user, and no, no password, right? Yeah. By the way, quick question for the audience. When I click here, finish button is disabled. What does that mean? We create a bug. So, but for, for now, let's, let's do the real thing. Why would you want to save an empty password? I don't know. <laughs> All right, so we, we now install our Garrett repository. So, finish. I want to query that. So, right now, Garrett is, like, we are using Garrett in two ways. One, for code reviews, but also, in this case, for fetching all the sources, because Garrett is only a proxy to our Git repository. So, first, the reviews part. These are all my reviews. You see, query type is my changes. Just do all of them. Okay. And then let's import the projects into the workspace. All right. So we can go to File, Import. You should explain to me. I'm the contributor here. Yeah. It's like Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And maybe expand the Eclipse or Garrett. So that, that's the real one. Second. That's the actual one. And it, it has cached the list of repositories available there. And you could select any of these repositories and um, clone them into your local workspace easily right. just by selecting it. Cool. So a lot of the Eclipse projects are already on there. Some are still hosted in CBS or they don't use Garrett, but most you can actually find on there. And we, we created a local copy of the task repository, which we're going to use. All right. This and tasks. Um, so we're actually contributing to Mylan today. Select the master branch um, so that's a little faster. All right. OK, that looks good. That's eager. We should fix that Interesting. as part of the talk. <laughs> so it's now looking through the revisions, I think, that are on the repository. Um, so actually, this could take for you if, you, if you do that at home. Like, you can do that at home. It can take a little bit longer, because the repositories, depending on the repository, have a huge source history. and. This can take a couple of minutes before you clone the whole repository. This but is the, local, that's why it's so fast. Yes. <laughs> so the good thing is here, you have enough time to get a coffee. I don't like eager today. All right, so we have the repository cloned. We see it over here. It's the Mylan task repository. And let's import some of the projects. Any idea what we want to contribute to today? Yeah, let's pick task core and UI. Wow, we are really working on task core? That's, that's crazy. All right. So, import these things. I don't know what's going on here. So I, I, I think I deleted that same repository <laughs> from the workspace, and it probably has references to the old repository. So OK, sorry. so it's your fault. All right, so now we have our project. So now it's the time that we can actually start like fixing a bug or implementing a feature and contributing it back to, to the Eclipse repositories. So these are actually two plugins that are part of the Mylon task project um, that provide exactly that taskless view in Eclipse. So actually what you see here is implemented in there. And we want to fix one thing in here. Yeah, maybe switch to the scheduled presentation. I've Prepare the task. Oh, thank you. So, by the way, for, for those who, who don't know Mylan, um, you get all your Bugzilla tasks in the task list here. Just as easy as that. So, let's look at the task. You want me to, to fix the, that thing here? Yeah, so this is a, actually a Mylan task that somebody requested. Uh, they don't like the fact that if you create a new task in Mylan, it always has a new task as a summary. They would like that to be an empty summary so they can provide the summary. That's fair. And that sounds like a really easy change. Maybe activate that task. Yep. And. Um, oh, you already prepared <laughs> the context for me. That's awesome. So, Mylon has a feature that allows you to, to track um, the context of a task so it, it identifies the relevant artifacts um, for a task. That's why you see that filtered list. And Benjamin already knows what he needs to change. 
So it looks like default summary sounds like, yeah, that's what we want. So let's fix our first eclipse bug here. All right, that was easy. Is that fixed? Let's see. All right, it's, it's giving me a warning. What does the warning say? Non-externalized string literal. All right, quick fix will do it. So well, we usually try, um, we try to share as many of the Eclipse settings as we can uh, so that everybody working on the code has the same conventions built in. So every time you, you save a file, we reformat it and there are warnings for the different uh, conventions that we use like externalizing strings um, or commit templates. So if you now do a commit on the project. The good thing here is so far nothing happens because in Git commit is local. But Git template is also defined so that everybody uses the same one. So we have our commit message pre-filled due to the active task, and that's also how we should commit it to the projects. So commit that thing. Oh, that's getting annoying. So we now see we have one change that's not yet in master that we can push. So the, the funny thing here is I'm going to push this now, but as you know, I'm I'm on a project, I'm not yet a committer. So I'm still in the contributor role. Um, how's, it, how's it possible that I can push here? So if Benjamin now takes that local change and pushes it to the server, it doesn't go directly into the master branch. But it goes to the Garrett code review server, and the server creates a new code review for that change that Benjamin made. So. All right, so. At this point? I've done my change. Uh, I will quickly look at that review here. So let me see, was it that way? Right. So this is the web interface of, of the Garrett code review server and that looks very similar to the one on Eclipse.org. And that now has this, this new code review that Benjamin just created. Exactly, and when we, like I can actually look at my own code review I just pushed. So you see um, the owner is the user here I just pushed that. Review is in progress. Um, so far, nobody has reviewed my change. Still waiting on the committers. And the cool thing is, for me as a contributor now, um, I don't have to wait on a committer to do anything because after I just pushed, here's Harry Hudson just building my change on the build server. Like it, it, it grabbed my new change, is running the full build, and is hopefully reporting back to me in a second. So let's refresh here. And you see, whoops, build is unstable. Uh, when I now navigate to the Hudson server at eclipse.org, I actually see there's a test failure. It says, okay, there's a test, test summary that is failing. Seems I only contributed a change but didn't adapt the test for it. So for me as a contributor, this is, this is great because I see before even the committer looks at it, does it compile, do the tests run, do all the integration tests run? So it's easy to run unit tests locally, but it's way harder to run all the integration tests that, my, that the project might have on my local machine. So that's why this is pretty, pretty cool for contributors to get started and see the results uh, pretty soon. So do you want to review my code? Sure. We're gonna switch roles and um, now a committer would, so we'll pretend this test failure didn't happen. We'll just pretend <laughs> that worked. Um, committers can go in or anyone can go in and say, hey, that's a great change or say that doesn't work for me. Um, and then provide feedback on that change. I can say, I verified that this works. I reviewed the code and then what Eclipse also has is this IP clean requirement. So for any change, it has to be IP clean and pass the IP review. What's the IP review? <laughs> I knew you were gonna ask that. <laughs> um, so um, what we usually ask people to do is we have a documentation in our wiki and we say, please um, confirm the statements listed on, okay, whatever, blah, blah. Um, and only if that, the, the person contributing that change, only if they confirm it, we can actually accept it and merge it into the master branch. 
and we are going to look at what these statements actually are. So the first statement that we asked the contributor to make is that they authored 100% of the content that they're contributing. So we want to know, we need to verify the pedigree of the code. We want to know that it's actually the person contributing it also wrote it. We, know, we want to know that they have the rights to actually donate to Eclipse. So if their employer actually, um, if they're not the copyright holder, we need to know that the employer consents to contributing that code, for example. Um, so they need to confirm that for us. And we need to confirm that they're contributing it under the EPL so that we can reintegrate it with, the, with our sources, which are also licensed under the EPL. And so, that sometimes, it, we, we ask that on every change, so that sometimes sounds a bit like a broken record. But this is really important as part of the Eclipse development process that, that contributors have that awareness um, that the code needs to satisfy these requirements. So the, <clears throat> the funny question always comes up, why? Why do you want to do that all the time? Why do you want to annoy all your contributors that way? And the reason is pretty simple. It makes a lot of sense. So what happens at Eclipse is when a committer commits or contributes code, like this is, this is our committer here. When he contributes code to the foundation or to the Eclipse or repositories, that's no problem at all. As long as like committers know what the rules are at Eclipse, they know they have to commit that stuff under the EPL. They know they have to write it on their own and not copy from somewhere on the internet. So committers already know that. But people that are contributing to Eclipse from the outside, they might not know that. That's why we have the three statements that you need to make in order to, to comply with the IP process. And there are two ways, or at least there's one way how to do that. And that is when you as a contributor contribute code to the, to the foundation, it always has to go through one of the official channels, one being Vexilla, the other one being Garrett. Um, you can't just email some patches to a committer and he applies it. It's, it's simply not going to work because you need, we, we need a public facing um, repository where all these changes are record. Like you, you have to have a record there. So we can always, um, ensure that we, are, we, we can track down who contributed which changes and we need to ensure that everybody agreed to contribute that under the EPL. I think there was a question from Wayne. Or yeah, just to clarify, one of the big things is in, if you go through, through, uh, through Bozilla, then you implicitly uh, agree to the website terms of use, which grant the uh, committers the permission to use your software, to use your contract. That's good. It's a legal check. Yeah. Primarily. Thanks. Uh, two questions. The first one, if I want a, a grid snippet, but it's in the public domain, can I use it? Sorry, it, did, no, I didn't. It, it, it depends. Okay. So, um, because the statement is in the domain. So, I mean, if, if you didn't write it, then you can't consent to that, whatever we ask you to. But there's another way, um, and if we go to the next slide. If the, so what we showed, the process where the committer can actually do the IP review and confirm that um, this is okay to merge, that applies for small contributions, smaller than 250 lines. But if it's a larger contribution um, that's over 250 lines, or maybe it's an Apache library that somebody wants to use, or it's a, a snippet from the public domain, and then there's another process um, that requires an, a formal IP review where you take that code and you, you pass it on to the Eclipse IP team and they will do the, all the pedigree checks, they will look at the history, where does this come from, they will uh, track down all the people who contributed to it, they'll check if there's a contributor agreement in place maybe, um, which is I think the case for Apache, where everybody already automatically consents um, that they're contributing it under the, the Apache license and they will make sure that the, the license is actually compatible with the EPL. Yeah. Sorry. Do you double check the the code which is They don't. They don't usually. 
they don't check what the committers are doing. They, there's, there's a trust um, relationship, so they, they trust that the committers are doing the right thing, but um, if committers are unsure, or if it's a large contribution, then it has to go through the IP team, and they have to approve it before committers can actually take it and, and put it into the source control. <coughs> Sorry? Maybe that's another topic, but how do they approve that? Oh, they, um, they use automated tools that scan the source code, they look for suspicious comments, um, they look at the history. If it's, if it's a public open source project, they talk to the people. Um, I don't know, they do magic things, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, and it, it can take a while. So, for example, when the Hudson project moved to Eclipsework, they had, like, I don't know, hundreds of library dependencies that consumed all kinds of code from all kinds of places. So they actually, in order to move the code to a closer, they had to rewrite parts of the code. They had to change dependencies um, because some of the libraries weren't license compatible. Um, and that, I think, is still ongoing. So it's been ongoing for like a year. Um, and now they're finally getting to a point where they can actually ship it. So, is, it, is it the contributor or the reviewer? So the contributor has to say that he wrote the code and that he contributed under the EPL. Okay. And the committer, for the, for the small changes under 250 lines, the committer can say, okay, this is IP approved after he saw the three sentences from the contributor. If it's a larger contribution, it has to go through the whole IP process. Well, that's a real, it's a good point because only the committer can actually set this flag that it's IP approved. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the guard that only committers can say plus two, we approve this change, and plus one for the IP flag, it's clean. So the contributor has to notify the committer anyhow uh, that there is a new change, and with that notification, he has to uh, confirm that. Exactly. I mean, Garrett sends out emails, or you can use Mylan. Then you see. In, in general, the committers are watching the contributions or the, the changes that are in the queue for that project. So, for example, if you if you create a new change or push a new change to the Eclipse Mylan project, um, I'm pretty sure the staff will see that uh, and and looks at it. So, that's how it normally works. And if not, then. <laughs> So the, still there's, there's this final question, um, why all of that stuff? Um, if, when, you, when we think back to our pyramid that people are actually consuming Eclipse as part of their technology stack, like integrating plugins into their applications, using Eclipse as their application platform, it's important that that code is clean, that that code can be distributed and can be used by commercial vendors. That's why the whole IP process is in place, that we can always ensure that whenever I take something from Eclipse, I know it's under the EPL, there's no, no way around it, and I can use it in my own commercial applications. That's the biggest reason for having this process in place. It's, it puts a little bit of burden on the contributors and, and on the committers, but you, can, you get used to it pretty, pretty easy, and it, it provides a, a tremendous value for all the consumers out there. So now, I've contributed my first patch. Um, Stefan accepted it, it's great. So I want to tell my friends about it. How, how can I get that stuff out? Like how can I consume or how can the bug reporter consume my changes? He certainly doesn't want to check out my from the source code repository. Yeah, I mean, I, I work on the sources, but I know not everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so we publish weekly snapshot builds. Uh, a lot of projects do nightly builds um, where, you can, where you can just consume whatever is in master. But occasionally we'll actually do uh, a release. And a release on Eclipse isn't just creating a build and publishing on a download site, but there are actually some requirements. If it's a major release, meaning it adds new API, it adds new features, um, then it has to go through a release review. And that the first step for that release review is to submit the IP log. And the IP log is basically a record of all the contributions that were made to the project, of all the external dependencies 
that are not hosted on Eclipse.org, that are not maybe not licensed under the EPL. Um, and you have to submit this IP log to the IP team. They'll go through it. They'll check that all this, all the rules are followed. And Wayne will run a script that checks that you don't, that your the binaries that you build don't include any license, uh, any any libraries that aren't listed in the IP log. Do all kinds of checks. And if that's okay, if that's approved, then you have to create slideware um, to aggregate some information, like the project plan. Talk a little bit about what happened in your project. That gets posted, and then there's a quiet period for a week or two, a week, um, where the community can, can provide feedback on the release or can say that they have a problem with the release and nobody objects, then after that week has passed, you can actually publish the release on a clip store. So I think different projects have different schedules there. Like for example, Marlin uh, releases twice a year. Other projects release more often or less often. So it, it actually depends on the project and on the team behind the project how they want to treat that. Um, for like the outside, like everybody outside the Eclipse ecosystem, um, one important thing is the official like release of Eclipse, as many many people call it. And that's the release train, which is actually um, an aggregation of many many projects in the Eclipse ecosystem compi combined to one big release. So it's not the new Eclipse that we are releasing with the release train, but actually many, many projects in the last time, I think 72 or so, 72 projects combined in one release. So all these different teams, all these different projects coordinate with each other that they release on the same day at the same time. There's some preparation done before, so it's not an ad hoc uh, situation, but it, it gives all these projects way more visibility because if we do like 100 releases per year on all the different subcomponents at Eclipse, that works. But for consumers, it's re really, really hard to grab the right set of things. Like, OK, I need Mylan 2.3.1 and EMF 1.3.4. And that's not, it's not consumable for the outside. So that's why this release train is a whole coordinated effort between all these projects in order to get that stuff out. It's the, the Eclipse development process is really nice um, since it, it has some, some principled rules and it requires things like release reviews. But at the same time, it leaves projects a lot of flexibility in the way that they publish their artifacts. It doesn't prescribe a certain directory structure, but every project is, is free to use whatever build tool they think is right and whatever directory structure they like best. And that leads to a terrible amount of inconsistencies. And I don't know. Like I've struggled many times finding the update site for a particular project because it's different for each project. And that's where that release train really makes sense. Um, and in this, this year, I think the release train, uh, the Juno release train that was released in June had 72 projects, as Benjamin mentioned, that were all, um, and what the, 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 the way that the release train works is that um, each participating project provides a contribution file that specifies where their downloads are located. And then there's a tool that copies the different features from those different locations and creates this one aggregated common repository. And there's this amazing tool, <laughs> the B3 aggregator, that verifies um, that that repository is actually consistent that anything that you install from that repository can actually be resolved, so all the dependencies are in the repository. Um, so it's just this one go-to place to find all the different things that are available on Eclipse.org. So behind the scenes of this whole release train, actually each release, or each project, does its own release, publishes the results, and they get all aggregated in one central place and then pushed out as this release train repository. So this is how it, how it usually works. Here we also have all these consistency checks that EMF and Marlin and whatever works properly together. And people are testing on that stuff before it goes out as a release. And even the Eclipse downloads, if you go to eclipse.org slash downloads, these packages that you see, they're basically built from this repository. And there's, the, um, there's uh, a product file that specifies which features are part of a particular download and then 
um, that project is, is created based on whatever is in the repository. And, all right. So you've, you've seen me contributing stuff, so you should help me to become a committer today. Um, what does it take to be a committer or to become a committer? Right, so we talked about this meritocracy. So meritocracy, the, the way that you earn your way up is by making these great contributions. You demonstrate, you understand the Eclipse development I process. I opened a thousand bucks, I contributed so many patches. What else does it take? Um, then somebody needs to nominate Benny for commit rights, and any committer on a project can do that. They can go to the Eclipse portal, uh, they can enter the email address, Benny needs to have an Eclipse work account, which by that time he should have. That's fair. <laughs> and um, they have to provide some references, what Benny has done in the past, to justify this nomination. And then that gets posted to a public channel, like the mailing list of the project. And then all committers on that project can vote. And if nobody objects, and if Benny gets three plus one votes, then he will be a committer on the project. After his paperwork has been processed, his <laughs> employer has consented that he's allowed to do that. Um, but yeah, I'm finally a committer. Um, so, <laughs> thank you, Wayne. <laughs> I've done my paperwork all the time. So, You've seen today a little bit that contributing to Eclipse isn't that hard. Um, it always depends on your motivation, what you want to do, what you want to achieve. There are people in the community just doing it for fun. Um, but there's also this motivation of getting rid of bugs that are disturbing you each day. That's another, in my eyes, pretty good motivation. Um, and there's also the motivation of you're using tools, for example, in your, if you're developing RCP applications and you're consuming different bundles from Eclipse.org, you might want to get stuff fixed because maybe the team doesn't have the time to do it. So it's, it's, most of the time it's actually pretty easy to, to fix a bug, to contribute a patch. This also um, helps you to get in, to, uh, in contact with the committers to drive also the direction of the Eclipse projects. We're, we were talking about meritocracy all the time, and that's, that's, that's what is going on at Eclipse. Meritocracy is all over the place, so depending on what you do, it can influence the projects in, in a lot of ways. And it's, we actually do accept a lot of contributions, at least on the Milan project, um, and that is probably similar for other Eclipse projects as well. But this shows the total number of tasks um, that we resolved in a month, and the, the yellow bars are the ones that were resolved through contributions. And it's, I think, about 10% of our bugs are actually contributed by people who are not committers on the project. And as Benny pointed out to me earlier, it's like there, there are times when the, the yellow bars actually go down a fair bit. And that's often when somebody has contributed a lot of patches, um, they become a committer and then they're not counted as a contributor anymore, and then this drops off until somebody else comes up from the community um, and sort of fills that gap. I find it always pretty interesting because different people are using these tools in different ways or consuming these in different ways. So you get, you get, whole, like, you get to discussions on a whole other level when many more people are influenced that, are, that have a different point of view, and that's what's driving these Eclipse projects too in my eyes. So um, that's for how contributing to Eclipse. Um, one small thing, we will have a talk tomorrow again about the whole Git Garrett Hudson contribution workflow. Uh, we will go into detail there if you're interested in that. Also, you, how you can set it up on your own, how you can integrate it even better in the IDE. Like we showed the whole, the whole thing on the web today, but you can also integrate it all into your IDE and that's what we're talking about tomorrow, if you're interested. And I think that's it. I hope there are some questions and many, many people start contributing to the Eclipse project. Thank you. Thanks.
Any questions? From my side, um, <coughs> the way you showed how it works um, might be the way it will work in the next year, next few years. In my experience right now, we have a lot of projects that are not yet on Git, even not on Gary. Mm -hmm. And often you have the problem, first, where do you get your code? Project um, wiki pages are not always that clear that tell you where is the correct location to get your code from. Mm -hmm. What does it take to make your code actually compile? So before you can start committing and fixing bugs, you first need to, to get the project into your workspace, right? right? Get it compiled. And, and it's often a problem to get this first step done before you even can contribute the patch or Right, right. Whenever I see that for an, a project I'm interested in, um, I'll ping the developers, create a task, hey, provide a team project set, and please provide a target platform. These are the two things that you need to get started. For Marlin, for example, that's already there. Um, for other projects, it's not there, even, like, even more if they're not on Garrett yet. And uh, I, would, I normally ping these people, and they, they see the point, and they usually co or provide that stuff pretty soon. So, I mean, one of the good things is that every other SEM other than Git is being phased out. So, in December, if all goes well, uh, all projects will be forced to use Git. Not necessarily Garrett, um, but I expect that more projects will move to Garrett because that's, it's natural if you have Git. And there's no, there's no cost to having Garrett. Um, I would actually force everybody on Garrett. Well, we're, we're, CDS is shutting down. Uh, if the projects don't move, their debt will just shut them down. Um, we are actually working, I've got some new, new things that I'm working on actually to make it a lot easier for projects to, to specify the how do you get started information. So that's definitely something that we're, we're working on uh, and hopefully in the next few weeks we'll be revealing. Uh, if you're having trouble figuring out how to use a project, get in touch with them through their dev list. If they don't respond to you, tell me, emo at eclipse.org because if they're not <laughs> responding to you, they're not playing by the rules. And I need to help them understand what they need to do. Does that help? If I have to be physically intimidating, I have no problem. <laughs> want to be really fun, contribute that. Contribute the target platform, contribute the PSF, the team project set. That would be a first contribution to get others easier on the, on the project. What I really like is that some projects even use uh, Garrett for the website. Um, so you can, if you don't like their website, you can actually push a review for the website. I think even the Eclipse org website you could change. Um, I'm pretty sure Ian will be so happy about that. Oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not on Garrett. But at least if you don't like the EGET website, <laughs> just uh, <laughs> send them a Garrett review. And they can merge it the same way. And it's, it's totally fine to do that. Like, that's how these open projects are, or these open source projects are breathing and living to contributions. So don't hold back in contributing something. If you're not sure if that makes sense or not in the project scope, open the bug to discuss it. So ma many, many people at Eclipse, all, or at least all committers I know, are happy to discuss new things, new options, or when, you, when there is someone who's interested in doing something, um, I don't know any committer who would not be happy about that. And... Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, there is work going on behind the scenes in the Eclipse Foundation to revisit just about every aspect of these processes I hope in next year we only need 20 minutes, not, in, not a full hour. <laughs> exactly. So if you guys or anyone else has suggestions on how to improve the process, uh, email at the clips that are uh, or talk to uh, Maria or you know, other foundation staff and uh, bring your ideas forward and they're, they're going to be working on uh, trying to make all these processes smoother. I mean, some ask, there are some things that are necessary, but there's some of the things you described that made me cringe when I remember how hard it is. Um, you know, provisioning a new committer, uh, the provenance questions when a contributor makes a full online change. You know, yeah. All those things I think we're going to be really pushing on trying to find the ways to make these. And I think it's important that also contributors step up and tell us 
what is like that it's not working as smoothly as it could be. Like when, when you're a committer, you might lose the view of a contributor, even though with Garrett it's pretty much the same. But you don't see some some things that contributors struggle with. If nobody objects, we will never see these things. So if you see something like you said, there is no team project, that there is no target platform, tell them. Otherwise, they will simply forget about it. So that's that's also this this ping pong between committers and and the community that that the project can live on. All right. If there are no other questions. I think we're done here. Yeah. And feel free to track us down at the bar. Usually. <laughs> if you want to have Com any more commit questions. rights are three beers. <laughs>